we get it on the courtroom floor, we have another strategy for defense. Number 16 is what is and what is not law. What is color of law. How to analyze statutes, fact pleadings and motions and code pleadings. And what is a code pleading and how do you use them and when do you use them. Now these at first sound like strange and foreign doctrines. Wild, off the wall types of phrases that belong in the legalese of the lawyerism and it's too deep and too dark and dank for us to explore or understand. And to that I say balderdash and poppycock. There's about six or seven words there that you may or may not know. And what we're really going to do today, what we're in, in essence going to study today is how do you read? Now, I didn't learn how to read until I was about 37. I went to the government schools and it took me a long time to recover. When I got a legal document, when I saw a statute written like this, I thought I needed a lawyer. When I uh, got a nosebleed, I thought I needed a doctor. When I got hungry, I thought I needed a restaurant. When I needed money, I had to go to a bank. And so when we're talking about law, when we hear some strange and foreign words immediately, you know, our mind boggles and we buckle at the knees and we're unable to function and think any longer. So to make this extremely simple, let's just take a look at how many words do you think that you need to learn and understand to know legalese. I contend that there's probably 100 words in law that is in the criminal aspect of law that you need to learn. Statute would be a word that you probably ought to know and understand. You probably already have a vague idea of what that is. But here's a term called what is under color of law. Well, I can tell you what that one is. That's a law that doesn't apply to you, or it's a law that applies to someone else, and the policeman applies it to you. And that's called under color of law. In other words, he's pretending it's the law, he's telling you it's the law, and remember from the Miranda Doctrine, we found out that it is not unusual for policemen to give you false legal advice. And yet when you walk into the courtroom with a friend, who's uh, also known as your next friend, the judge or the prosecutor is liable to say to you, we're going to charge that fellow over there who's uh, practicing law without a license. I mean, here's your friend in court. You're charged here, you know, with a crime. And you have a friend come in, and they want to charge him, that is, your friend, with practicing law without a license. They do that in this state. Although I've noticed a change here in our county. I uh, <clears throat> went into court the other day, and I was sitting in the back of the room, and this citizen, some lady, was in there with her next friend, and uh, no one asked the question, who is that man sitting to your left? So maybe... Our uh, prosecutors and our judges are starting to learn some lessons, or at least some of them are. Now, when I say that we're going to have a reading lesson, let me first of all tell you a little story of my very first reading lesson. You know, there came a time when I had to learn how to read. And my reading lesson came like this. I'd run the scale at a place called Bliss, Idaho, and they have what's called a port of entry there. And all trucks are supposed to stop. Well, in those days, thinking that I had rights and I didn't understand the law, I went by the scale and I waved as I went by. First four or five times, you know, they didn't stop me. <clears throat> I had to give them a special wave, and when I gave them that special wave, they noticed me right away, and boy, did they get upset. And they came right out there and they gave me a ticket and they hauled me off to jail and they made me post bail and bond and one thing and another. And that was in the days before I knew better, and so now I don't post bail or bond, but in those days I did. And I went to court, and we went through the motion hearing, and remember, I didn't really know what motion hearings were all about. And so finally we got to the trial, and the state put on its case, and then it came our turn. And in those days, I didn't know what a prima facie case was, so I didn't challenge the state's prima facie case. You know, I'd made about every mistake that's possible, and I didn't exercise any of my rights because I didn't know any of them, and the judge was a heck of a good judge. I'd like to tell you what his name is, but he might get angry or upset if his name were used uh, nationwide or something on that order, so uh, we'll call him Judge Smiley. We used to have a governor in this state named Smiley. We'll call this fellow Judge Smiley. Anyway, uh, 
the judge was very helpful and I put in a motion for my right sua saponte and when you take a look through your file folder here on your case remember we gave you a case a couple of lessons ago on uh, a felony and I think there's a motion for your right sua saponte this is the first judge that knew and understood what the words meant and every time a basic right would come up, he'd sit there and say, Now, Mr. Gordon, <clears throat> let me inform you at this point in time, you have a right to cross-examine, or you have a right to do this or that, and you have a right to challenge the state's prima facie case. And I'm sitting there, what in the world is a prima facie case? I guess I can't challenge it because I don't know what it is. Now, he wouldn't tell me what the prima facie case was or how to challenge it, but he stopped the proceedings and he said, At this point in time, you have a right and that right is available to you if you want to exercise it, and he told me what it was. That's what every judge is supposed to do. Once in a while, you'll find a judge who's knowledgeable enough in law that he'll do that for you. Meanwhile, it's an appealable issue if they do not, because remember, you're there in propria persona. You're there as the citizen. You have a right to ask questions. You haven't been to law school. Well, we went through the trial, and this was the case where right after lunch, right at the break, the judge didn't come in. You know, normally they come in on the side. Well, this judge didn't come in on the side. This judge came in right through the very back of the courtroom, and he walked right up, and he put his arm around me, and he said, Boy, I wish I had this case. I'd win it in five minutes. He turned and just walked right on up and sat down on the bench and proceeded to preside over the conviction. And here I am sitting there wondering, now what was it that we could have done or should have done or what should we be doing here in order to win this case? And it happens that what I needed to do to win that particular case was I needed code pleadings. I needed to analyze the statute because, you see, I was actually innocent and didn't know it. You see, I was guilty of running the scale, all right, but the truck was empty, and since the truck was empty, I didn't have to stop at the scale, and the, and the uh, statute said so. Or, as I've said, what the statute didn't say was more eloquent than what it did say. So here we are. We get to the end of the trial. The jury goes out, and he charges the jury, and we didn't understand jury instructions in those days, so here's the prosecutor putting all the jury instructions in, telling the jury to come back and find me guilty. The judge is reading them to the jury and telling them, yeah, come on back and find this guy guilty. So I went in. We were sitting there, and pretty soon the judge's clerk comes in, and she stopped, and she said, uh, the judge is in his chambers. And... I don't remember exact words, but I think she said something like, he's available if you'd like to talk to him. And she left. And I had a friend there that was helping me, and I said, well, goodness, that's, uh, <clears throat> have you ever heard of that before? And he said, no. Gosh, that's really strange. And uh, so I said, well, you know, being bold and brash, you know, you've got to be the belligerent claimant in person. I said, well, let's go on back and talk to him. Let's find out. We'll pick his brain. We'll find out what it is that he knew, if we can. Maybe he'll tell us why we could have won this case. And so went back into chambers, and he lit up his pipe, put his feet up on his desk, and he opened the conversation by saying, well, how do you think they'll come back? And I said, well, this is my very first case, you know, and gosh, I just don't have any idea. And this fellow Steve was sitting next to me, and he says, gosh, you know, it's anybody's guess with a jury. And the judge said, well, most of the time it's that way. Well, what do you think, judge? Oh, I think they'll come back guilty. <laughs> Here's a guy that walked by and says, I could win this case in five minutes, and now he's looking at me and saying, you know, puffing on his pipe, well, I think they'll come back guilty. Mm -hmm. Why do you think they'll come back guilty? Well, because you didn't plead your facts correctly. And because the only, the only issue before the jury is, uh, did you run the scale or didn't you? You don't have any affirmative defense. You haven't done anything or taken the stand or shown anybody that the statute doesn't apply to you. Statute doesn't apply to me? Well, wait a minute. Isn't this the law? Don't these statutes apply to everybody? No, of course not. A statute only applies to that class or category of persons to whom it's addressed. And every title has a 
what's called an enabling statute. So when you want to take a look at the law, you take a look, first of all, at the enabling statute. What's the subject matter? When you get into the title, it's always going to say, all persons shall, or all persons who. All wh of what persons? Take a look. You know, we have a statute, and it's a federal statute, and I don't know it's under Title 42 or whatever. Let's just say it's Title 42. I don't know for sure. But every January, all aliens have to register, right? If you're a resident alien, you have to register. When you go to your post office during the month of January, and you register, yeah, my name is Joe McGillicuddy, and I'm from Switzerland, or I'm from uh, England or Greece or wherever you're from. And uh, are you working, or are you on vacation, or... Why are you in the United States? I suppose you answer, answer this little form, but that statute is going to say all persons, everyone. It'll use those all-encompassing statements or all-encompassing words, but the words only apply to aliens. They don't apply to me because, you see, I'm not an alien. So, therefore, all persons under that particular enabling statute don't apply to me. And so here's the judge, he pulls out the statute, and he looks at it, and it was a long statute, and he went through and it said all trucks that are carrying iron, and all trucks that are carrying steel, and all trucks that are carrying coal, and all trucks that are carrying water, and it just went through trucks and trucks, and you know, and pickups and vans and all kinds of, I mean, there were no loopholes, it didn't look like to me there was a single loophole anywhere, and besides that, I didn't know how to look for a loophole. Every statute has a loophole. The guys that write these statutes want loopholes so that they can win their cases. The law only applies to the ignorant. It doesn't apply to the knowledgeable. Well, I didn't know that in those days, so here I am in the judge's chambers, and he's reading this. And he looked up, and he said, uh, why didn't you plead the code? And I looked at Steve, and Steve looked at me. Plead the code? What does that mean? Well, didn't you notice in here? There was never any testimony or evidence presented by the state that your truck was loaded. And I looked at Steve, and Steve looked at me. What difference does it make if it's loaded? It says all trucks must stop. Well, certainly. It says all trucks loaded with, and then it goes down and tells you what it's loaded with. What is the one thing in there that doesn't have to stop? Empty trucks don't have to stop. Do you see any statement in here that says empty trucks must stop? All trucks loaded with hay, all trucks loaded with steel, all trucks loaded with coal, and all empty trucks must stop way and enter and clear the port. doesn't say that. Now, if your truck was loaded, Mr. Gordon, you'd have to stop. That's the law. But if your truck isn't loaded, then it doesn't have to stop. And I've written letters to the Supreme Court, written letters to the legislature, and I've told them and told them about that. And every time a trucker comes into my court, and every time that trucker argues that statute and pleads that code, I dismiss at the motion hearing. About 15 minutes later, the clerk came into the office, and she says, the jury's back. We went out, and the jury said, guilty. Now, I'd just been in the judge's chambers, and he said, here's the way you could have won your case. The judge is sitting there saying, I know you're innocent. The jury comes back with a guilty verdict, and he gets up there with all of the pomp and ceremony that only a judge can display, and he says, now, Mr. Gordon, would you like me to pass sentence today? Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, uh, well, yeah, I guess I might as well. The fine will be $75, Mr. Gordon, which just happened to be what my bail was. Case dismissed. Well, now, I appealed that, and I finally won, but it took 11 months more to win. You know, I could have won that case. The case never should have gone to the jury. That case should have been won in the motion hearing. And I could have won it at the motion hearing, but I didn't know how to read. Now, I paid $20,000 to do five cases. That's right. I had a friend of mine who was a lawyer, and he taught me law. He taught me how to be a competent pro se. He still teaches me, by the way. I have to go out to his office once in a while and say, okay, now, Charlie, I want you to show me what I needed to do here. What do I, how do I handle this? And uh, 
But I paid $20,000, and I figured that for $20,000, I'd better learn how to do this because I couldn't afford $4,000 a case to go into these courts. And this was my very first pro se attempt, and uh, I went in and I learned my very first lesson. And the lesson is you need to learn how to read. Okay, so let's take our very first reading lesson. I have a four-pager here. Now, you've got a stack of paper here with this lesson. And let's take a look at the one that says four from the car case. And up at the top, it'll say license. Okay, so let's take a license case and let's look at a licensing statute and let's see who it is that's required to have a license and who is required to show a license and etc. And that's assuming now, remember, now as a matter of law, I claim I don't even come under Title 49 of the Idaho Code, so I don't need a license. But let's assume that for the sake of argument, you've, you've been charged with a license violation and you want to go in and there's some argument on just the facts of the case. If we take a look, it's on page 76 and it says there's a number four up there. It was number four in a file folder. And it says from the car case. And it says license at the top, and it's page 76. And if you've got your place now, let's take a look at number 49317. All right, and so here I think, if I remember right, this is the first statute in the licenses. And let's just read along and let's see what it says. The director, that's the director of law enforcement, must appoint as examiners the sheriff in each county and may appoint any deputy sheriff, chief of police, or other officials or private citizens whom he deems qualified. And the director must appoint at least one employee in the Department of Law Enforcement who shall be skilled and highly qualified in the method of giving operators and chauffeurs license examinations who shall have authority and it shall be his duty to instruct the sheriffs and their deputies and chiefs of police or other persons appointed by the director in the method of giving operators and chauffeurs license examinations and acquaint them with the use of such equipment and forms as may be needed. Any person... Oh, any person, let's underline that, conducting examinations for operators or chauffeur's license shall make such written report of findings and recommendations to the department as they may require. You know, it's got some citations down there, and there's a statute. Let's suppose that the officer stops you and he gives you a ticket, and you sign the ticket, and you sign it under threat, duress, and coercion, or whatever it is, and you look, and it says 49.317 on it. What do you do with that statute? Do you look at that and say, Officer, I think you've made a mistake. I think that that particular statute uh, only applies to uh, director and local examiners. You know, <clears throat> I have seen people going to court, and I've been charged, where the policeman meant to write down 49... 318 or 49 319 and you wrote down 49 317 when that happens to you shut your mouth you go into court and you let the prosecutor and I, I did this one time this prosecutor he just sitting there and waxed eloquent and this man didn't have a driver's license and he refused to show it to the officer and the law says that he has to show it to the officer and blah 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 you know and he's just going on and on and he put the officer on the stand, and he put another officer on the stand. And about three hours later, they got all through prosecuting me, and I raised my hand, and I said, Excuse me, has the state rested, Your Honor? Yes, the state has rested. State's finished with their case? Yes, state's finished with their case. Motion time, Your Honor. Would you dismiss the jury? I move for dismissal, Your Honor, because... Under Idaho Code 49-317, let me read to the court the charges for which I am here today and for which I am prepared to defend myself. It says here, Your Honor, now this is called the prima facie challenge. When the state finishes its case, they can't come back and use rebuttal or bring more witnesses. And so at this, mo at this moment in time, and you, you know, just when you get good at this, you know, when the prosecutor sits down, he's going like this. He's standing up. And now, Your Honor, the state rests. And as he's sitting down, you should motion time, Your Honor, and you should be on your feet before he calls lunch break. Here's where you're going to win your case. And this happened to me one time. 
and the judge dismisses the jury with great pomp and ceremony. You know how this little scene comes down. And Well, Mr. Gordon, uh, <clears throat> what is your motion? Well, I motion that I'm going to move the court for dismissal, Your Honor, for failure of the prima facie case. Now, the prosecutor has done a wonderful job today, Your Honor. He's proven that I don't have a driver's license, and he's proven that <clears throat> or tried to show that I didn't show the driver's license. And he showed that I'm a person who's required to have a driver's license, and he's done a wonderful job, but he has failed totally to prove the case for which I'm charged. And that is, he has failed to show, Your Honor, that I am not a qualified driver's license examiner. He's failed absolutely, Your Honor, to show that I am not qualified to uh, issue licenses both uh, chauffeurs and operators. And he's failed totally to show that I have failed to appoint at least one director or one employee in my department who is skilled and highly qualified in the method of giving operators and chauffeurs license examinations. And therefore, Your Honor, he has failed totally to prove the state's prima facie case, and for that reason, this case must be dismissed as a matter of law. Now, how often that's going to happen is uh, anybody's guess, but I'd say about 10% of the time, policemen will write the wrong statute down. Now, I can remember in the early days, you know, I would see something like that, and I'd bring it to the prosecutor's attention, and then he would amend the complaint and get the statute correct. And then he'd go ahead and prosecute me and find me guilty. Whenever you find out that, uh, as an example, uh, I did this one time too, they had inadvertently set the trial date beyond the six-month speedy trial limit by about nine days. And I said, excuse me, Your Honor, but that nine days, uh, you see, you've scheduled it nine days beyond the speedy trial. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Gordon. We'll just move it back here about two weeks. Mm -hmm. And then they went ahead and proceeded to uh, prosecute me and convict me. You see, there are times when you want to keep your mouth shut. When you take a look at the calendar and you see that they've scheduled you beyond the speedy trial, you walk in, it's the morning of trial. Is the uh, prosecutor ready to move forward? Yes, we are, Your Honor. And is the defense ready to move forward? No, Your Honor. It appears that we're beyond the speedy trial rule under Title 19, Section 1102. Therefore, I move for dismissal pursuant to statute as a matter of law. See, any time you make an offer of proof, the judge has to listen. And any time that you make a motion to dismiss as a matter of law, the burden is on you to show that the law says. And so you bring out the law book and you just look through here and you say and blah, blah, blah. Now, when you're talking about this, this uh, prima facie case, here's what's happened. Remember, it says the director must appoint local examiners. Now, I've been charged on the ticket with a violation of 49.317. Now, sometimes they'll wake up and they'll realize they've made a mistake and they'll get in there on the morning of trial. Your Honor, uh, uh, the state would like to move to amend <clears throat> the complaint, which reads uh, IDO Code 49.317 to uh, read IDO Code 49.319, uh, Your Honor. Objection, Your Honor. This is surprise. Why, I'm totally shocked at this change and at this this uh, the motion to amend. Why, I'm here prepared to go forward, Your Honor, and I've researched and I've got all of my documents, and I'm prepared to defend Idaho Code 49317, but I'm absolutely unprepared. Uh, what is 49319? I had a judge one time, he's a real benevolent type, and he said, well, Mr. Gordon, I'm going to let you have the Idaho Code here. Why don't we just adjourn for 15 minutes and you go ahead and read the code and then we'll proceed and amend the complaint and we'll let you defend. Baloney. That's a new charge. 49.319 is a new charge. I need at least 60 days to prepare for this case. I am absolutely unprepared to go forward. And at that point in time, you shut up and stand mute and let them pull the trial together and try you under 49.319 while you're charged here with 49.317, and you object timely. Well, I haven't even read 49.319. I have no idea what it's about. Oh, it's another licensing standard. Well, maybe, I'm, maybe I should have pled guilty to that. Maybe I should have pled not guilty. Maybe I should have gotten a lawyer. 
maybe I'm not guilty. There could be 14 uh, Supreme Court decisions pursuant to Idaho Code 49.319 that aren't applicable to 49.317, Your Honor. See what's happened? If they amend the complaint on the morning of trial, or any time within five days leading up to trial, I'd file a motion and I'd complain and demand another 60 days to prepare for trial every time. Don't ever let them do that. They'll do that to you. You know, these traffic court judges are really prosecutors. And so you're in there with two prosecutors. And in Idaho, remember, both of them are judicial officers and both of them are, are simply administrators. They're simply administrating, uh, administering the contract. You've got a contract with the state, and there's no matters of constitutional law involved. We're just coming in here to meet out the punishment, Toby. All right, so going back here to 49.317, here's your prima facie case. Now, well, Your Honor, <clears throat> the state has failed to show that as the director, I have failed to appoint local examiners. It says here that the director must appoint as examiners the sheriff in each county and may appoint any deputy sheriff, chief of police, or other officials or private citizens whom he deems qualified. There is no evidence and there has been no testimony, Your Honor, that I have failed to appoint a sheriff, chief of police, or any other official or private citizen whom I deem necessary and whom I deem is qualified in the counties of the state of Idaho. Prosecutors failed totally to show that. He's also failed, Your Honor, to show that the director must appoint at least one employee in the department. Now, he hasn't shown whether I have employed or appointed one employee or ten employees or no employees. And in order for me to be guilty of violating this statute, he'd have to show by testimony and evidence that I failed to appoint at least one employee in the Department of Law Enforcement, Your Honor, and he's totally failed to do that. Uh, who shall be skilled and highly qualified in the method of giving operators and chauffeurs license examinations. And he's failed to show by either testimony or evidence that the person or persons to whom I have appointed is not skilled and qualified in giving driver's license or operators or chauffeurs license examinations, Your Honor. And that employee shall have authority and it shall be his duty to instruct the sheriffs or deputies, chiefs of police, or other persons appointed by the director, and he has failed totally to show whether I'm the director or whether I'm the qualified employee or one of the qualified employees who is qualified to give these examinations, Your Honor. And so the prosecutor is, by the standards and by the language of this statute, totally failed in his duty to present a prima facie case that would be necessary in a conviction under this statute. Now, in the method of giving operators and chauffeurs license examinations and to acquaint them. He hasn't shown whether I have acquainted them, taught them, trained them, or failed to acquaint these people. He's failed to show whether I'm the director of the Department of Law Enforcement or that I'm not the director. Whether I am, I am an employee of the Department of Law Enforcement or I'm not an employee. There hasn't been any evidence at all, Your Honor, that I am even the director of the Department of, Employ of, of uh, Law Enforcement. He hasn't shown one shred of evidence, Your Honor, to show that I'm even an employee of the Department of Law Enforcement, much less that I fail to live up to the standards and the terms and conditions that are set down in this statute pursuant to this person and his employment. And the use of such equipment and forms as may be needed. Your Honor, he hasn't shown that I haven't used the proper forms and the proper equipment to give driver's license examinations. Any person conducting examinations for the operators and chauffeur's licenses shall make such written report or findings. Let me point out, he hasn't shown one shred of evidence or any testimony whatsoever that I have failed to make all of the required written examinations and reports, rather, written reports and findings and recommendations to the department as it may require. He hasn't even shown, Your Honor, what the department may require in the way of reports and examinations. Your Honor, I'm afraid that the prosecutor in this case has failed totally to show any evidence or any liability whatsoever that this person is obligated or required under Idaho Code 49-317 to even 
to even that this statute rather even applies to this person, much less that I've failed in any of these particulars of this statute to perform any of them. And for that reason, Your Honor, I move for dismissal as a matter of law. And I demand that this court take judicial notice of this statute and of this citizen's status in relationship to this statute. And thank you, Your Honor. Now the prosecutor, he comes back with a rebuttal. See? And his rebuttal will be something off point like, uh, Your Honor, uh, Mr. Gordon is using a very specious and frivolous argument here. Uh, this is obviously just a technical error. It's harmless error, Your Honor. And it's obvious that uh, Mr. Gordon was charged with not having a driver's license. And the officer made a little mistake and made a little boo-boo here and charged him with Idaho Code 49317 instead of 49319. Uh, Your Honor, this is just a typographical error. And uh, I'd move to dismiss the defendant's arguments as being specious and frivolous and without foundation and without merit. And he'll sit down just calm, cool, and collected. On appeal, you'll win your case. You'll win your case because you're going to hang on to this like this was uh, the life uh, belt or your your uh, safety rope and you're dangling over a thousand foot cliff because you're pleading the code here. You've been charged with this statute and that's the only statute that you're prepared to defend. And if the officer can't charge you with the right law, I mean, how would you like to be, by example, and you'll get a little chance for a rebuttal. Uh, your Honor, how would you like to be charged with... Uh, burglary and the prosecutor comes in and shows that uh, you're guilty of murder and the charge is burglary. Um, I don't really want to go to the gallows, Your Honor, because uh, burglary doesn't merit the gallows. I might be guilty of uh, burglary, but I'm not guilty of murder. And I'm in here to defend burglary, not murder. And that's your argument right here. I'm in here to defend drivers. I mean, uh, I'm in here to defend uh, the director and his employees and the standards whereby this statute applies. And it either applies to me or it doesn't. I'm contending that it doesn't. See your first reading lesson? Now, I don't know how often this comes up, but it's come up with me three or four times. They've charged me with the wrong statute. Charge you with the wrong statute. Keep your mouth shut. Walk on in there. Let him put on his case at the trial and the jury is sitting there. And you've gone through about four hours of jury selection and state's evidence and you get up and judges I've never had a judge ever uh, rule against me on this particular point but it's not uncommon judges make bad decisions all the time especially at the lower levels the higher you climb the ladder of the appellate level the more competent the judges are alright so there's one example of how a statute when it's brought against you and it's off point it's the wrong statute lay them away on it all right, let's take a look at 49.319. And that's down at the bottom of page 77. Here's a real nifty one. I've won a couple of three cases on this one, charging me with, let's read it and see what it says, license to be carried and exhibited on demand. Then it says, every licensee shall have his operator's or chauffeur's license in his immediate possession at all times when operating a motor vehicle. And he shall display the same upon demand of a justice of the peace, a peace officer, or a field deputy or inspector of the department. However, no person charged with violating this section shall be convicted if he produces in court an operator's or chauffeur's license theretofore issued to him and valid at the time of his arrest. For the purposes of this section, display means the manual surrender of his license certificate into the hands of the demanding officer for his inspection. Okay, Toby, when the constable stops you, you give him this piece of paper, you see, Toby, and he'll read your paper. In Nazi Germany, you got to the border with Poland. Have you got your papers in order? You know, in the United States, we have the driver's license, registration, and proof of insurance, and those are called your papers. You can't travel among the several states in the United States without your papers, and you know that as well as I do. So we have the same kind of police state mentality here in the United States that they have in Germany or had during World War II. You think you can go across Checkpoint Charlie from West Berlin to East Berlin without having your papers in order. You know, when the Gestapo stops you, those blue uniform thugs that run around on our streets demanding that you have documents in order to go downtown, don't you produce them? Oh, well, there's some people that don't, because there's some people that don't have these kinds of documents. 
So let's take a look and see what happens. I went into court one time, and I was charged under this statute, 49.319, see? And the policeman got on the stand, and he waxed eloquent, and there was a backup field commander there, and he got on the stand, and he said, Mr. Gordon doesn't have a driver's license. And I stood there, and I demanded, and I said, Mr. Gordon, I want you to deliver into my hand your driver's license. And what did Mr. Gordon say? He said he didn't have one. Oh, and then what happened? Well, I gave him a ticket because he didn't have a driver's license, and you have to have a driver's license in Idaho. Here's my Gestapo agent. You see, I have my papers in order, and I got to the checkpoint, and, you know, here he is. And the poor fellow doesn't know how to function in life unless everybody's got their papers. i got to digress here for a moment. Bob Holstrom, you know, he was out in the traffic court there one day, and he's a funny kind of a guy. He doesn't have any wallet, and he doesn't have all these documents and papers. He thinks he's a free man, and he walks around on the streets and he doesn't have a driver's license, social security number, he doesn't have permission from his government to work, he doesn't register his car, and he doesn't have any insurance, and gosh, he just doesn't have anything. You know, he just, the way life is, he just dumb as a pretzel, I guess, and he just doesn't have papers. Anyway, this marshal wanted to arrest him out there for a traffic violation of some kind, and I don't know exactly what the charge was, but they were out there trying to harass him, and he was just kind of having a nice conversation, and he said, uh, uh, What's your name? He says, Who wants to know? Well, I want to know. I'm the marshal here, and I've got a warrant for Bob Halston's arrest. And I was standing right there, you know, and I'd cover my mouth. <laughs> Funny. Hilarious was the word. And so Bob's saying, As soon as I run into him, I'll let him know. He turns around, he starts talking to his wife again. Are you Bob Halston? Who in the hell are you? Well, uh, about that time, you know, the marshal, this, I won't use the marshal's name. He's just dumb as a post, this poor marshal. Nice guy, just dumb. And this marshal said, well, uh, my name is uh, uh, Marshal Jones. Now, that's not his real name, but we'll call him Marshal Jones. And so, Bob is standing here talking to his wife, and, he's, uh, and this marshal said, well, are you, are you Mrs. Hallstrom? Yeah. Well, is this your husband? I don't think I want to answer any of your questions, and when I see my husband, I'll tell him that there's a warrant for his arrest. About this time, you know, just Marshall's just sitting there. He just knows that, you know, just, this has got to be Bob Hall. You're under arrest! He just couldn't contain himself anymore. <clears throat> Bob says, uh, what are the charges? Well, I've got these parking tickets, and you're under arrest for these parking tickets. And so he took Bob into this little room, and they started going through his pockets. And Bob is emptying everything, and I think Bob had about two pens, a constitution, and a couple hundred dollar bill. And this poor marshal says, uh, what's your name? I'm not going to tell you. In fact, at this point in time, now that I'm under arrest, the Miranda Doctrine comes into play, and I don't want to talk to you at all. I want counsel, and I want you to get my counsel in here right now before I answer any questions. And my counsel is Mr. Gordon. He's standing right out there. Well, you're not going to get to talk to him, and, and uh, what's your name, and where do you live, and who are you? Well, you must know who I am. You arrested me. Are you Bob Holstrom? Do you like that name? Because if you like that name, you just hang whatever label on me you want to. I'm not going to talk. And uh, you're asking, you this, you're conducting an investigation here, and you're asking me questions, and I don't have counsel, and that's a violation of Argus Singer versus Hamlin as well as Miranda. Now, are you making a uh, Terry Frisk? Are you here under the Terry rule? Is this reasonable suspicion? Do you have some reasonable suspicion that I'm Bob Halston? Well, where's your driver's license, and, and where's your social security card, and, and where's your wallet? Bob says, uh, do I need those documents? Well, of course you need those documents. How can you identify yourself? I know who I am. You must have the attention of a piss ant. My attention spans pretty long. I can remember who I am all day long. Well, how do you go downtown? Who told you I go downtown? See the answers? Who told you I go downtown? And this poor marshal, he's just sitting there. 
I can't believe this. Now, fortunately for them, they arrested the right guy. What if they'd have made a mistake? If I'd have been on my toes, I'd have walked up to Mrs. Hallstrom and said, Come on, honey, let's go. And we'd have walked off and they might have arrested me for being Bob Hallstrom. Then it'd be false arrest and malicious prosecution and all that. And then I'd have another Title 42 suit and we'd have another shot at making some money. But as it was, I was asleep at the switch and missed my opportunity. And that's the way the ball bounces. Now, to get back to the point, you see, there are some citizens in the United States that don't carry documents. I'm one of them. I don't have any documents. You ask me, well, how do you go downtown? Sometimes I walk. Sometimes I ride the bus. Sometimes I drive. That's the way I get downtown. 49.319 says, license to be carried and exhibited on demand. Exhibited on demand. Okay. Now... In reading that, it says license. Okay. Well, what's a license? Well, here's mine. I carry mine right here. I carry it up here in my shirt pocket. So there's my license. Now I get in my car and I drive. Policeman stops me. He comes up to the window and he says, uh, I want to see your driver's license, registration, proof of insurance. Oh, excuse me, officer. I'm reading Idaho Code 49319. Just a moment. Let me see if I'm a person who's required to uh, give you these documents. Every licensee shall have his, uh-oh, every licensee shall have his operator's or chauffeur's license in his immediate possession at all times when operating a motor vehicle. Okay. Well, what if you're not a licensee? If you're not a licensee, well, then... You don't have to produce your driver's license on demand then or have it in your immediate possession at all times when operating a motor vehicle, do you? Because it says here, licensees shall have licenses. It makes a lot of sense to me. <clears throat> all persons who carry a pen shall have said pen in their immediate possession at all times. I think that makes a lot of sense. So I'm going to put my pen right up here. Now, I'm a pen carrier, okay? All pen carriers shall have said pen in their immediate possession at all times. Okay, there it is. See me? See the way I comply with the law? There it is. I'm a pen carrier. There's my pen. Now, let's try it this way. All pen carriers, it says every pen carrier shall have his pen or his pencil in his immediate possession at all times when operating a motor vehicle. Okay, I'm operating a motor vehicle. Policeman stop. Have you got your pen or your pencil? No. I'm not a pen or pencil carrier. So therefore, I don't have one. Have you violated the statute? No. How can you violate the statute? It says plainly, every licensee shall have it. Now, if you are a licensee, if you have a driver's license in your pocket, okay, put my pen back in here. If you are a pen carrier... Policeman says, I want to see your pen or your pencil. Oh, yes, sir. Here it is. You can see it. No, I want you to deliver it into my hand. Wait a minute. Oh, yeah. For the purpose of this section, display means the manual surrender of your pen into the hands of the demanding officer for his inspection. Okay, officer, here's my pen, and I'm delivering it into your hand for inspection. Well, if you're a pen carrier and the statute says that you have to deliver the pen manually into his hand, then that's what you have to do. But if you're not a pen carrier, the statute doesn't apply to you. Don't know how many cases the government lost arguing this point. Finally, here in Boise, they got real smart. They quit charging me with 49319. Now they charge me with something else. I don't know what they're charging me with. Oh, they stopped charging me with driver's license violation. They figured out they couldn't win that one.